well, let's begin. Hello, um, I'm Andrew Hansen. I'm your host. And uh, there's my image at the bottom there. We've got two other people speaking. We've, as well as myself, we've got Anne Curtis, also from the National Physical Laboratory, NPL. She's an atomic clock expert, and she'll be talking a little bit about how they work and how they're used. We've got Peter Williams, who, well, he's an advanced materials characterization scientist, but in his spare time, he's an absolute GPS expert. And we're also very, very grateful to Chantelle Nobbs, who is um, someone from the Institute of Physics who has, well, without her, today would Jeff definitely not have gone ahead. So we're grateful to her. And I think she might chip in towards the end as well. And so the cat of curiosity asks, what is this all about today? Well, I'm going to start off with describing a little bit about what NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, is all about and why measurement is really, really important in all aspects of life. And we'll then talk about atomic clocks, what they are and how they're used in GPS. Peter will then bring along some measurement terms just so we all know what we're talking about. And uh, we'll describe the causes of errors in GPS. I'll then talk about the challenge, what we ask people to do and what results and conclusions we got from the challenge. And then we'll open it up to the floor. You can all chip in. There's um, a chat thing on the side of this and you can be entering your um, questions throughout that. They won't be shared with everybody, but we've got a team of um, technicians here and they will relay some of those questions to us at the end. And then if you want to ask other questions, do at the end as well. But do put questions in as we're going along. So, here's a rather brash statement. Measurement makes science more scientific even than maths. Goodness me. Enabling science, engineering and trade. Well, here's an image from one of our school's posters and it doesn't matter that you can't see the details or the little blobs explaining how science, well, how measurement science intrudes and enables every single aspect of 21st century living. It really is very important because we need to know how much we've got of what, whether it's how heavy or light something is, the chemical amounts of pollutants, um, measurements of length. I wear glasses and I couldn't wear, I couldn't wear them unless they'd been measured properly somewhere along the line. So engineering, trade, none of these things would happen unless we had proper measurement working. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the National Physical Laboratory. Our three presenters today we all come from this um, establishment and it's been running for about 120 years. It's the National Metrology Institute and metrology is the science of measurement. We maintain and develop the UK's measurement standards to which all of your measurements, whether you're measuring the length of a bit of paper with a ruler or how much um, flour you've got, if you're measuring out some ingredients, these measurements all trace back to our one building. We have experts in mass, length, time, and, well, all areas. I used to be involved in colour. We've got about a thousand scientists, mostly in Teddington. We've got some in Scotland. We've got some in Huddersfield. We've got them all over the UK. In fact, pretty much every university works with us and we have about 200 people studying their PhDs linked with work that we do. We're sponsored, we have a government sponsor, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And they, well, they own us, we're a public corporation. And uh, you can see there's a list there of other organizations also involved in um, science of measurement. So we're not the only UK um, laboratory involved in measurement, but we are by far the largest. And you can't work where we do without having some funny stories to tell people. So let's tell you the top three oddest things to measure. In at number three. Yep, it's the cat of curiosity. And for a couple of weeks, I was building a machine to measure the shininess of cats. Yes, that's what I did. A crazy job to do, but uh, someone had to do it. A pet food manufacturer wanted to prove that their pet food made cats shinier than anybody else's. And you couldn't trust people's observations for this. You actually had to have a machine that was impartial and behaved the same way year on year out. So I had to research what glossiness really meant and then build a machine that we could put on the side of a cat to measure its shininess. In at number two. 
the crispiness of biscuits. This is kind of a, like an interview question. If you wanted to come and work for us, how would you measure the crispiness of biscuits? Well, you could put it in your mouth and crunch it, but that's not very good. You won't get the numbers out of that. We actually built a rig that broke the biscuit and then listened to the sound that it made, particularly the sound in the ultrasonics region beyond the threshold of human hearing. And from that, we were able to work out how crisp a biscuit was. Why? We wanted to see how well different types of wrapping kept the moisture out and therefore the biscuits crisp. In at number one, there are so many stories, we just kind of almost pick these at random. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what this is? When people see this, I do this talk quite often. Um, when people see this, they say, is it a sponge? Is it a piece of bone? There's a little three micro meters thing there showing that it's small so it's a photograph taken down an electron microscope or something that's absolutely tiny it is actually the surface seen through a microscope of the blackest black that ever there was we manufactured it or we designed the process for making it at npl it was part of a camera a really really sensitive camera we wanted to, to absorb all the light that fell onto it and if the light didn't escape it didn't reflect from it it was absorbed converting its energy into heat energy and we measured the temperature which was an indication of how much radiation how much light radiation was falling onto it so this is part of a camera but visually you just couldn't see the surface because nothing was reflecting from it and for a time this was billed as NPL super black and this is another question that we might ask you if you wanted to come and work for us how would you measure the internal volume of this vehicle I mean the cabin area and again, the sorts of questions, sort of answers that people give us, well, put some water in there and then measure the volume of the water. Well, that's a great idea, uh, but uh, it's a car. Uh, the water's going to leak out. OK, so put the water in a plastic bag. Well, yeah, that's a good answer. This is what we did. We filled the thing with these little balls that you get in creches and uh, then somebody had to count them. That was the number. Now it's not just, of course, the volume taken up by the ball, but also the volume taken up by the ball and the space around it and how it shares it with the next one. So not a completely trivial measurement to do. Um, yeah, measurement can be fun and odd and interesting and useful in the way that all science can be. And measurement is the comparison of something you don't know against something you do know. So here we've got a standard, which might be your ruler, measuring an unknown thing, which might be a piece of paper. It's a quantitative comparison, which means that we're putting numbers onto it. Now, it's often the case that the standard we're measuring against is not actually in the same room. There's, and we have these master standards where we work at MPL, the master for length, the master for the kilogram and so on. And you don't directly compare your bit of paper against our artifact. Someone will have come along with a sort of copy of our meter or whatever and uh, compared it against our standard and then that's taken and compared against another one that's compared against another one and eventually through many intermediate measurements along a chain you get a result that's uh, sort of traceable back to us every time you make a comparison you introduce a little bit of uncertainty so you're not quite as right as you were as you get further and further away from our master standard and we can plot that uncertainty like this so you might think, oh, I want nothing but the best. I'm going straight to NPL. Well, that would be very expensive because these top level measurements are really, really pricey. So you kind of tap into the system at your affordable level, but also you don't necessarily need to know the size of your piece of paper to the nearest atometer. So uh, most rulers will probably suffice. So you go somewhere further down the line. Now, it doesn't stop with us. We ourselves are part of an international system, the International System of Units, the SI. SI is French, Système International. Um, and these base systems units, um, that's used by everybody throughout the whole of the world. So we all use the same kilogram, the same meter, the same second. So our science is compatible. The results are useful forever, I hope because people knew exactly what we were reporting on at the time. And we sit on many international committees to make sure that our meters and our kilograms are as accurate and precisely defined as possible. 
So now I'm going to hand over to Anne Curtis, who's going to explain to you a little bit about atomic clocks. Well, hello, my name is Anne Curtis. I'm a senior research scientist in the time and frequency group here at NPL. Um, so then I should really start with the basic, basic question of what is a clock? So a clock is made up of an oscillator. An oscillator is something that's periodic. It means it repeats. So in terms of something you all are uh, very familiar with, a clock with a pendulum, um, this periodic swing of the pendulum. Um, it also includes electromagnetic radiation, which also oscillates in time. Um, the second part of a clock is a counter, because you've got this radiation, but you don't know anything about it, or you have this pendulum moving, but there's no way to look at how it's moving over time. The counter then measures the oscillations. And in terms of the clock, that's the mechanism that takes each tick and talk and turns it into seconds, minutes, and hours and keeps track of time as it's going. Um, the third thing that can be very useful for a clock is a reference. And the reference is really how you check that your clock is on time. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. The real question is, how does having a clock reference to atoms give us so much better accuracy than these clocks that are based on pendulums and internal workings. And that really has to do with the fact that these atomic clocks, the oscillator in the clock, the clock itself is electromagnetic radiation that's then referenced to an atomic sample. And I'll go through that because this is quite, quite important to understanding how atomic clocks work. So if you have kind of an electromagnetic spectrum and energy is increasing on this axis, you have the kind of low energy radio waves, the visible spectrum from red to blue, and then kind of UV and X-ray as the energy increases. And you can also talk about frequency. The frequency of the oscillations increases as well. Frequency and energy are proportional, so you can talk about them in the same way. According to quantum mechanics, atoms and atomic systems have quantized energy levels. And very basically, that means that when you have your atom with an arrangement of electrons, there's kind of a low energy state where these electrons want to be in. And you can shine any kind of energy you want on the system, and nothing will happen until you shine just the precisely correct radiation on your atom to excite those electrons into a new configurational state. So you can shine whatever you want on this atom, but it won't become excited until you get the frequency exactly right. And it's the precision at which you have to get this frequency right that makes these clocks so stable. So the atomic clock is basically made up of an oscillator that produces the radiation. So if it's a microwave clock, that's a microwave cavity producing microwaves. If it's an optical clock, that means it's in the visible, and that's laser technology that produces the radiation. You have a counter of some sort that measures the radiation. And then here's your atomic reference. And the reason, again, this is so um, important to the atomic clock is this oscillator is not going to do anything to this atomic reference until you get the radiation frequency exactly right, in which case your atomic reference will produce a signal that you can use to tell the oscillator it's gotten the frequency right. And this is the basics for the atomic clocks. And the reason that atomic clocks are, again, so powerful on top of that is atoms of the same element in the same isotope, that's the 133 bit of the cesium, are identical. And that means if you make your clock somewhere else, the atoms are going to behave exactly the same way. So all of a sudden, these clocks are extremely re reproducible, unlike any kind of pocket watch or a pendulum clock you can imagine. Although everyone, I bet, has a phone that can tell you where you are, I don't think many people are aware exactly how that works and how vitally important the clock development that we're doing here and at other national metrology labs feeds into this kind of thing. So first, I'll just explain how does it work. And then hopefully by the end of it, you'll understand why clocks are so important. So I'll do that with a, just a basic example of time of arrival ranging. And it calls the foghorn example because the idea is the sound of a foghorn is going to allow us to know where we are to find our location. So let's imagine we're a boat and we're about to sail off. And before we do, we synchronize clocks with a whole bunch of other boats. So We've all synchronized, so at 5 o'clock, it's 5 o'clock on all the boats. The reason this works is we know the speed of sound is about 335 meters per second. Now, velocity is simply how far something travels over a certain amount of time. In this case, meters per second is how we've defined this. But you can change that equation around, and you can 
from knowing the velocity and the transit time of a signal, you can know the distance that that signal has traveled. And that is basically the whole idea here. So if we set off a foghorn at a certain time, say five o'clock, and I on my boat measure that foghorn coming in a couple seconds later, you can then from that information of knowing the velocity and the time it took between when the signal was sent and when you received it, you can now know your distance from that signal. Now, of course, you could be anywhere along the circumference of the circle that's played out. So then you just need a second boat who also has a foghorn. It'll circumscribe another circle. So now there's two points you could be at where those two circles intersect. So with a third boat, you then precisely know where you're located. So what do clocks have to do with this in terms of accuracy and precision? Well, let's imagine there was a slight timing offset after you synchronized your clocks, one of the clocks has moved a bit. Let's say it's moved by about a second. So there's a second um, offset between the two clocks, but of course you don't know this because you aren't next to each other to check. The speed of sound is 335 meters per second. So this small error in your location is gonna be equal to the speed of sound times whatever this small offset is. And so that leads you to a 335 meter error. And of course that gets added to the errors produced by the other timing errors on these other boats. And instead of one very precise point that you know you're at, there's now this large area where you could be located. And so the moral of this story is that timing errors, errors in your clocks, reduce the accuracy of your position measurement. Satellite navigation works in precisely the same way. You have a receiver on the Earth, a satellite in the sky. They have clocks that are synchronized at some level. There's some distance delta x you would like to measure. The same equations apply, but now instead of the speed of sound, you're dealing with the speed of electromagnetic radiation, um, which is much higher. And this, of course, leads to, and if you want, say, sub-meter accuracy, you're going to need nanosecond timing in your clocks. Now, the clocks we have aboard these satellites are microwave clocks, and they can very easily get this kind of timing and get this kind of precision in placement. Thanks very much, Anne. And uh, now it's Peter's turn. So take it away, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. So we should now look at some terminology about um, you know, some of the numbers that we'd be obtaining from our GPS unit. So you can see here um, the sorts of numbers that you get off a GPS unit. And we have quite a lot of, of digits because we need you know, quite high degrees of precision so we know where we are accurately. So. The resolution of a, a measurement instrument can be de um, defined as the, the smallest uh, increment that it can it can tell you about. So in this case, the, the digit at the end. Um, precision, this is more to do with how um, the, the preciseness that the instrument um, of the result it can give you. So for instance, if, if this was a number and these last two digits were varying randomly, um, then we might only be able to be confident about um, you know that this was the, the value here. So if we kind of look at a real world example, so we make a measurement of where we are, we get a result. But actually we know where we are. Um, so we're actually some way, in this case 10 meters, away from the true location. So this is the, the actual accuracy of the measurement. Quite often in metrology, we're trying to work out what the true value is, but unlike with a GPS system where we know where we are, we don't know. So we have to make multiple measurements. And of course, the multiple measurements sometimes disagree with each other. So, so in this case here, we're looking at the repeatability of these measurements, and, and the second measurement is now something like seven meters away from the first one. So by making multiple measurements, we can gain an estimate of the confidence with which we can know where we are. And so that's what we describe as, as an uncertainty. The uncertainty is, is our confidence about the measurement uh, and we express it um, as a sort of 95% confidence. So in this case, we're somewhere within the blue circle, which has a, a diameter of 12 meters. So what we expect that one time out of 20, 5% of the time, we'll be somewhere outside of that. And this is how we sort of express our, our degree of confidence in the measurements we make. 
So to kind of make it uh, more obvious, we can sort of see what happens with precision accuracy, because sometimes these words get um, confused by, by people. So we're here, in this example here, we have high accuracy. We're very confident, we, we're very sure about where we are, but actually each one of the measurements has quite low precision. But by averaging them together, we can get a nice accurate result. In this situation here, we have high accuracy and high precision, so we, we're very confident about where we are. Here we have a low precision again, but actually the, the results here in this case are, are miles off, so we've got low accuracy. Um, and in this situation, it's even worse. We're very confident about where we are, but we're nowhere near it. So accuracy and precision, you have to be slightly careful about. Um, they aren't interchangeable. So what limits the accuracy that we can get with the GPS system? So if we look at um, this formula, so our um, error in, in position, so X, can be expressed as uh, an error in the velocity, so the speed of the, the signal that's come from the satellites, but also a, a, an uncertainty or an error in the timing. And so there are a range of different effects that can uh, affect these. So things like changes in the atmosphere, uh, multipath errors, receiver errors, and we'll describe some more of these, uh, we'll describe some of these in a minute, but also some sort of uh, quite complicated physics effects, some number of which come from, from Einstein, um, because we've got clocks that are moving quite fast in a gravitational field, we have to worry about things like redshift and time dilation, um, but that's beyond the, the, the this um, talk. So atmospheric effects. So above the Earth's atmosphere, where the atmosphere is quite thin, um, solar radiation, particularly the UV photons, will tend to ionise the atmosphere, and so it makes it a sort of charged uh, atmosphere and we know this because you can um, get television signals bouncing off of the, the ionosphere um, and, and that's got a, a density of electrons in there and of course it depends whether the sun's up, what the sun's what the cycle's doing etc as to um, you know the density of the electrons there and so that affects the, the velocity of which the signals travel so essentially it changes the index of refraction so similar to the way that a light light um, or light gets split out into a rainbow in a prism. In, in the prism, the light of different wavelengths is travelling at different speeds, and essentially the same thing's happening with here. As the electron count changes, so the refractive index changes, and therefore the delay changes, and so our position would, would vary even if we were standing still because of this small effect. Um, this can be corrected if you have a, an expensive satellite receiver that uses two frequencies. So by using two frequencies, you can measure the total electron count essentially, and then you can make your own correction for the index of refraction. But most um, consumer GPS units don't, and therefore they they suffer from this form of error. But lower, closer to the close, closer to the ground, so in the troposphere, where where most of the atmosphere is and where all the weather is, um, you get another form of delay. And this is not dependent on frequency, but it depends on things like temperature, pressure, humidity, you know, the weather that's going on. And so we've got. You know, by using uh, weather sensors and by using models, again, you can you can perform some corrections if you have good enough information about these. Things. So, as Andrew showed in the the video, multipath errors. So, if you are in an urban environment and you've got walls and and other sort of uh, obstructions around you, then the um, signals from the satellites can tend to bounce off. And then you get maybe an echo or you, you get the, the signal slightly after you expect it to. Um, and this can confuse uh, GPS units. And so the more satellites that you can see and, and the cleverer the algorithms that you have in your receiver, um, the, the better you can do to try and correct for this. So this chart kind of gives you a, a flavor for the sorts of scales that you expect with a sort of standard GPS unit. So orbit errors is an uncertainty in actually where the satellite is. Um, clock error, so this is, as we mentioned, relativity. Uh, the ionosphere is quite a big uh, uh, uncertainty term. Weather, much smaller, multipath, and then a small term from receiver noise. And we mentioned differential GPS here. So one way of making your GPS receiver more accurate is to have a, a nearby receiver that's fixed to the ground and it knows its exact position. So if 
it measures an error in its position because of these sources of error, it can you can then take that error signal and correct your position and therefore you can get rid of some of these errors and make some of these other uncertain or these other error terms smaller. However, you need to be quite close to the um, the receiver that's doing the, the correction signal. So it's used for, for sort of precision um, measurement applications where you're trying to measure the size or the shape of a, of a landscape or, or areas rather than where you're just trying to find out where you are in the environment. So we've mentioned things like latitude and longitude, but, but how do we measure these? What's our sort of reference frame? So for latitude, it's easy. North Pole is plus 90, South Pole minus 90, and therefore the equator somewhere halfway between the two is zero. But when we're measuring around the Earth, we've, we're completely free as to say where the zero line is. So if I asked you, you know, where is zero longitude, then you'd probably tell me that it's there. So this is a, a Google Earth map of, of Greenwich and the Greenwich Observatory. Uh, and this that line there is down the prime meridian and you can stand with your legs either side of it. But if you took your GPS unit out, you'd find that you weren't actually at zero. And if you walked across the ground to try and find where zero was, you'd find it's it's, it's over there. It's 101 meters different. And, and so hang on, did they put the buildings in the wrong place? Well, no, actually, the buildings were built several hundred years ago, and, and that is where the, the meridian was at the time. But since then, we've been refining our models of what the ellipsoid of the Earth is. And so we have changed subtly where the, the zero position is. Uh, and the zero position used by all the GPS receivers um, was agreed in 1984 by the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. And so it is actually 100 meters away from the, the um, prime meridian as defined several hundred years ago. So that's a little bit of trivia that not everybody knows. Again, if you've got a now you've got a highly accurate positioning system in your pocket, there's quite a few games you can play with it. So this is one that's come out since GPS units um, emerged in the last sort of 10 or 20 years. So this is a map of Greenwich again, and it's got a, a list of uh, points here. So this game called geocaching, people um, you know, post online a location, so a GPS location, um, and then a clue to help you find a cache, which is usually a small container. Uh, and when you find this, you can write in the log, I found it. Some uh, of these uh, caches contain items that you can you know, take one item out, put an item in, uh, swap them around the place. And, and it is quite fun because you get to see areas and, and, and places that you'd never normally see. It was somewhere which is really quite locally interesting, which you'd possibly no, never know about. So some of these containers are quite big. You know, if you hid this in a forest, it might be quite difficult, but if you hid that in a town, it might be quite easy to find. But they can also be extremely small. If you imagine hiding a small magnetic container somewhere down a street, it can be quite difficult. Um, so if we now move back to uh, our challenge and uh, over to Andrew again. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, very well explained. And it's confusing sometimes that so many words are used uh, that mean really special things in science. So back to the challenge, as you said. So what we asked people to do, well, what we wanted to find out was the effect of buildings on the repeatability of GPS results. So we set this challenge to the world in general. We asked them to decide a location in doors and then for them to report on the physics of this location. So how much concrete there was above and around them, the building specifically, and uh, the weather as well. We asked them to measure their position five times and to reset their device between each measurement. And then to find the range in the latitude results by subtracting the smallest number from the largest number, just to see the difference between the two. And to convert this number into meters because we're not interested in your location. And then to do the whole thing again with the same device, but this time outdoors and to report on the device type and the weather when these measurements are all done. So devices report latitude and longitude, which are on a coordinate system like shown as, as shown here. And you might wonder why we chose latitude for this experiment. Longitude and latitude are both angles. Longitude is uh, your angle from uh, a line going through the North and South Pole and Greenwich, just about, thank you, Peter. And latitude is an angle, um, how far away you are from the equator. 
Now, on a sphere, latitude is proportional to length on the surface, which is fine. But longitude is not. Can you see how longitude, the, the steps are closer together as you get closer to the pole. So latitude can always easily be converted, whereas longitude, the conversion to length is not so simple. And on Earth, latitude times 110,000 metres is the distance in given in metres. So this is what we did. We use this. So whenever you design any sort of experiment, not just this, but any experiment, you have to think about the parameters, the things involved. And we split these up into different types of variables. Now, the independent variables are the things that we change, that we are alter, that we are in charge of, if you like. The dependent variables are the things that we are interested in seeing change as a result of us tinkering with the independent variables. So in this experiment, the independent variables were the presence or the absence of a building around us. And we could also change, we were in control of, the measuring device, which is why we asked people to report um, the status of both of these. As a result, something changed. We hoped that the range of five measurements would change as a result of this. It might be that uh, having a building around you would uh, improve or make worse the range, uh, and also different measuring devices might have different uh, ranges as well. Does that make sense? But there are other types of variable too. There are control variables, and these are the things that would muck up our measurement if we didn't control them, if we didn't keep them fixed throughout the duration of the experiment. So in this instance, if the satellites move, then there might be errors in where their location is. Um, these atmospheric effects might differ and there are lots of things. And so really we want these to be fixed as much as possible. And of course, the real situation is not that we just remove the building from the person. The person <laughs> actually has to move. And um, in order to do this, that means that our measurements are being made in two different places. So we have these other things called extraneous variables. And these are things that just mess up our, in, our dependent variables and can influence the result as well. So in this instance, it's the test location. If we're moving to a different place to do the outside measurement, um, the fact that the position of the satellites has changed and the fact that we're doing the measurement at a different time, we can't do all these measurements at exactly the same time. These might affect our dependent variables. Oh dear. And then if you think about it, because the measurements are being done at a different time, the satellites will have moved, the atmosphere might have changed. So a lot of our control variables in this experiment might suddenly become extraneous variables and everything will get messed up by these other things. It was not a great and easy experiment to do. And yet, on the whole, we got some results. Here they are. Um, within just a couple of days, actually, we had a fair number of results coming in from different people with different devices. Uh, on different days, different, quite a lot of these extraneous variables going on. But on the whole, they supported our hypothesis. We had a secret hypothesis, a belief that we were trying to prove or disprove, that being inside increases the span of results. The idea being that um, by having a weaker signal from these satellites and by having signals bounced off buildings, this could make the results not quite so good. So if you look at the ones that we've marked in blue here, all of these results support the hypothesis. And in fact, somebody went to Costco and wandered around inside the car park, which was a couple of floors down with lots of steel and concrete above. And their um, range was just enormous, 159 meters. So you can imagine someone going into shop and their other half wanting to know where they are. Well you'd have known to the nearest 159 meters where they were. And yet when this person went up to the next floor of Costco, um, it was just a steel roof above, suddenly the range of results dropped from about 160 meters to about 43 meters. And then when they were outside, it went down to four meters. So the ratios on the whole suggest that you have a better measurement result, a better precision if you are outside and directly in vision, if you like, of the satellites than if you're inside. 
So this is pretty much our last slide. And after this, we'll take some questions. The conclusions of our experiments were that we had a good span of situations investigated and that in most cases, GPS worked well, better outside than inside, although not in every case. And it's interesting that whenever you do an experiment, not all the results agree with what you expect, but it's important to honestly report them. Measurement outside was typically about two to one to about 10 to one times better, if you like, more precise location. Notice we're using the word about precision here, nothing at all about accuracy. <laughs> no indication here whatsoever as to whether you're actually closer to the real place. The resolution of these devices, because we were quoting angles to six decimal places, was about 10 centimeters. And maybe we're naive to expect that GPS can give us, give us a location to the nearest 10 centimeters. We're getting down to the timing limits that um, Anne was talking about in her talk. And repeatability, uh, well, that's how close they are together, the precision, if you like, um, between one meter and 159 meters. So <laughs> the resolution and the repeatability, very, very different indeed. And there was no apparent improvement for newer devices. We had quite a range here of devices, but it didn't seem to improve significantly with the newer machines. A rather odd side sort of observation. Scientists like iPhones, about 46% of the UK phones are iPhones, and yet everybody who took part in this thing, uh, they were just using iPhones, which is just a side thing. It's interesting, whenever you do an experiment, you quite often find other things that you weren't looking for at all. And of course, the other thing, whenever you do an experiment is you think, oh, I shouldn't have done it this way. We should have done it this way instead. So suggestions for an improved experiment are that we should collect much, much more data. That's normally the case. That we should interlace outside and inside measurements. If we do the inside measurement and then we run to an outside location, do a measurement there, and then back to the inside location, that way we can be fairly confident that we can start to take out the fact that the measurements were done at different times. Do you see what I mean? That's not, that wasn't something that we designed in the original experiment, and I think we would put in, in if we did a second version of it. Um, I noticed, because I was doing a trace of GPS signals, that every 20 minutes, my phone appeared to leap into a different place. And it was regular as clockwork um, every 20 minutes. And I wonder whether this was something to do with the collection of um, uh, satellites that were in view or something else. I, I don't know. I really don't know what it was. So if this is true, then you've got to try and work out when this jump occurs and then do your experiments within one of these jumps because it, the jump or whatever it is might be affecting your results. And use an agreed app. Interestingly, Find My on Apple phones seems to be more accurate than the results that we were getting here. I know that if we lose one of our phones at home, we can pretty much use Find My app to tell us whether it's in the front of the house or the back of the house, which is certainly better than the sort of results were being indicated by the rest of this study. So that's it. Oh, a little advert. If you enjoyed the idea of um, doing an experiment at home and contributing to your results to us, please can you visit um, Measurement at Home on the NPL webpage. There's loads of challenges. This is just one of them um, about all sorts of things. And well, I designed them and I try to make them all possible with just the stuff that you'd normally find in the house. So now let's answer your questions. Just to remind you, here are the um, things that we've gone over. Hello. So, um, can you all hear me? You can. Right. Fantastic. It's Andrew. OK, uh, we've had some questions that have come in. Uh, if I can find them. There was what there was quite a, a number of questions about um, speed of sound and the fact that in um, uh, the Foghorn example from Anne, uh, she cited a particular speed for the speed of sound. 
um, 343 is what it's currently saying, but I think in the chat, in the, in the presentation, it said 335. Anne and I and a couple of other people have been talking about this um, as a result, and Anne's come up with the this, this statement, well, that's the speed of sound if you're at a temperature of 6.5 degrees Celsius. The, the temperature of sound varies with humidity and temperature. They're interlinked as well. Um, and arguably that was the temperature um, on the boats when they were doing their experiments or between the boats. So that, that kind of makes sense to me. So although the book values might be different to the number that um, Anne was quoting, I think that's a reasonable answer to that one. Um, technical people, can you tell me some other questions that came up? Because I can't see them here at the moment. Hi, Andrew. So Hello. we have the question, who invented GPS? Oh my goodness. I, I think I'll, I'll take that one. There was also a related question saying how many GPS satellites are there? Um, so, so GPS was invented by the US government and they launched their first satellite in 1978, so quite a number of years ago. Um, it's been operating fully, so with the full number of satellites they originally designed it for since 1993. Um, and importantly for civilian users, they, they, they introduced errors into the signals so that um, civilian users could have a very poor estimate of their accuracy. And in 2000, they turn those off. So we all get to get the sort of meter or two meter accuracy. And so since then, we've now had you know phones having GPS units. We now use it for navigating in planes and all sorts of safety critical applications. Um, but since then, also another of other um, GPS type satellite systems have come online. Um, the Russians have got their GLONASS system. Uh, the European Union have launched their Galileo system and even the Chinese have a system called Baidu and currently there are 105 GPS sis, uh, satellites uh, up there and depending on on what receiver you've got, what phone you've got, you may be able to use all of these. So with a normal GPS system you can see around up to 12 satellites but if you've got all these other systems it might be you can see 20 or 30 uh, and therefore you can really get rid of the errors because you're using more data. Brilliant, thank you. Paris, any other questions? Yeah, so another one was how can we make GPS better and what would we be able to do if we have better GPS? I'm sure. happy to start with that one, um, if that's okay. Yeah, please so, do. Um, one of the one of the ways we can make GPS better is to reduce the timing error as we saw in, in the talks. That's really what allows you it, the timing errors are what limits how you can pinpoint your position. One, it's one of the main things. And so one of the ways to do that is to put a more accurate type of clock technology in the satellite. And this is one of the things a number of people around the world are working on are clocks that aren't based on microwave signals but instead are based on optical ones, which can increase their accuracy more than a thousand fold. But the trick is making these slightly more complicated atomic clock systems small enough, light enough, and not so power hungry that you can put it in a satellite, launch it, and then have it work for a very long time that these satellites need to be going. And of course, if we had a more accurate clock, we could pinpoint our position a lot more accurately. And in that sense, it kind of, you have to use your imagination of how would you use that information to make life better for people in the sense that now we certainly didn't expect that we could have mobile phones that we use as real time maps. But if you could make the precision of a placement known, you could use this for autonomous cars and trucks for driving very safely if you know exactly where you are. Whereas now if you don't know where a car is within five or six feet or meters, then obviously you could have a problem if a pedestrian is also where the car thinks it isn't. Um, and if you knew things more precisely, you could use these GPS systems to control vehicles on the street, but also maybe um, an entire production line in a factory where you can track every individual item and know where it is. Um, and there's also a lot of like search and rescue applications that GPS is already used for, but a more accurate GPS system would allow you to pinpoint where people are even faster. 
Thank you. It kind of surprised me actually that the data we found from this experiment that it was actually so bad because as I said, I, I can locate whether my phone is in the front or the back of the house and yet the data that I'm indicated by these these apps here, it just doesn't, it's nowhere near as good as that. So I think where, there is some more software going on, isn't there? Some more interpolation, maybe it's uh, integrating, it's, it's joining together data over a longer period of time for this really, really precise location that the system is capable of. The, the signal levels that we get from the GPS satellites are incredibly faint. Mm. Uh, and so it, it's only been the development of better, more sensitive electronics over the last 10 years that will allow you to even use your GPS indoors. Previously, if you went under a tree, your GPS receiver didn't like it very much. Um, as far as more accuracy is concerned, the more later GPS satellites that are being launched now have more frequencies so they can they can correct for more of these error sources automatically. And again, with better algorithms, um, the the civilian signals from from Galileo, for instance, their specified accuracy for, for the civilian usage is around a meter. So we are getting towards that that level where you could be confident that you are on the right side of the road, for instance, as Anne yes. mentioned. Yes, although I think the mapping software sometimes assumes that you are on a road going in a particular direction and carries on Im imagining that. It's funny when you turn off, doesn't it? There's a little while before it goes, OK, you've turned off and you're not going where I thought you were going. <laughs> and I've been to your laboratory. It is fantastic. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and your atomic clock is just gigantic. And I just think back to the very, very earliest um, Louis Essen's uh, initial cesium clock. And that would have been a gigantic thing as well. And it's fascinating how the miniaturization of this technology just progresses and progresses. And so you've got cesium clocks now that are effectively, oh, what, what sort of size are the smallest ones? You get miniature ones, can't you? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's not that's neither de imperial or metric. That's just hand size. Yeah, you're muted, you're muted. Um, yeah, they actually come in extremely small packages right now. And it's not just the size, of course, it's how much power it takes to run yes. them. Yeah. And the idea is as you miniaturize, you and, and then of course, not just miniaturize, but make more cost effective to make them, you can use, you can get more accurate applications all over and uh, people can use them for all sorts of things. Fantastic, yeah. I guess you could even have ensembles of them if they're not that expensive and, you know, you can have several working together, yeah. Well, and error correcting for each other. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Any other questions, Paris? Yes, we've got one from Gordon saying, is there anything that can't be measured? I <laughs> wonder who Gordon is. Oh my goodness. I, I, I have been asked this question before. One thing I've thought of is it, well, I, I, my background is the measurement of colour and you might have thought that because colour is such a human perception, measuring it would be very, very hard because you're trying to get a machine in a way or a model to emulate the, uh, the performance of a human system, which includes psychology, uh, physiology, <laughs> biology, uh, which is very, very, very complicated. This is the century that we're tackling biology. It's the most complicated of all of the three traditional sciences, I think. Um, but I think we have pretty much cracked colour measurement. It seems to be working quite well. Um, but um, uh, pain, that, what pain was one that I thought about because different people's perceptions of pain can be quite diff different, can't they? Uh, and you can't get inside someone else's head to actually feel the sensations that they are. And maybe they feel pain differently as well. So pain might be something that's tricky to measure. Uh, a while back, we were actually asked to think about measuring happiness of the nation, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a psychological thing rather than a hard physical measurement. So there, there are, I guess, some philosophical things that exist that, you know, you want to put numbers onto, but how do you fix them on in a, a meaningful and absolute way? So, but I, I, I think our measurement techniques are just getting better and better. So the ability to measure hard physical things, I think, is improving all the time, giving us better resolution on the world. But uh, does anyone, are the other two folks, have you got any ideas on this? Have you been, have you been asked this? No, just shaking your heads and smiling. Thank you for supporting me. 
<laughs> yeah. we did have at one stage a project called the measurement of naturalness and so we were trying to so when 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 you go into the shop and you buy products and they you know they're, they're real wood or something like that there, there are you know, companies wanting to produce fake wood and therefore they want to have some kind of measure of how well it's going to look and whether it's going to convince people that it, it, it is real wood even though it's not um, and so we, we we've had some projects doing that and you know looking at the tactile the feel of products as well um, again using physical measurements so they are you know measurements which you can get hard numbers out of but that you could then correlate to, to what people's perception is by you know, interviewing people and finding out what they felt and then correlating those with, with the sort of measurements to understand you know, how, how natural something was. I remember that project and um, it wasn't just about being able to measure naturalness. When they were designing the experiment, they actually said, we, we want to do, uh, we want to be able to measure the somethingness and it had to be something that you wouldn't normally think about measuring and they wondered about aesthetic um, pleasure or just attractiveness or just odd words like that and the, the one of the main points of that experiment was that you were inputting lots of data there was the tactile stuff there was the thermophysical properties there was how tacky it felt uh, and there was what it looked like and the texture uh, the color etc and all of these were put as inputs into a little model and they programmed what we now understand to be an artificial intelligence and that computer algorithm would then predict what it thought other what they thought people would have as appraisals of other samples so you train the thing on several bits of wood you measured it in lots of different ways and then you got the model to predict what people would think about these new samples of wood that it was given whether the people would think that they were natural or not but you could have done you could have used words like happy or sad or whatever the idea was the test method that was being examined not just the actual uh, task in hand so yeah I, Sorry, I was just gonna say I can add another kind of dimension to this whereas in the measurement of time and frequency as we do the the definition of time is really making a definition which we then realize in yes. a laboratory environment and we it's it's actually frequency is what is defined yes um and then the question can be well if if you're trying to measure time you get into a much more philosophical question of you know what is time is it a real thing is it just as things change how we perceive that is it a human perception is it something you can quantitatively measure um if our system in which we're measuring it is the universe and time works differently in different parts of the universe. How valid are our measurements here? So there, there are lots of complications at a deep philosophical level of what are we measuring? Really, we're just making a definition of something and then trying to realize it in a real life situation so we yeah. can compare two things. But it's yeah. actually a deeper question of what are we really measuring? What What is real? Oh, here we go. <laughs> I love hanging around with time measuring people because they eventually bring you into onto this topic. What is actually time? Because it's not like um, at length where you can have a point here and a point there and you can measure the distance between the two. You can't stick something in time and then have a bit of string between that and now, can you? Well, can you? Is, is that what you're doing with a frequency measurement? You're counting the number um, of pulses well, between then and now? Well, exactly. But when you're talking about then and now, how do you define that? Well, in terms of the second. Um, and in fact, now really we shouldn't even be thinking about time and space as distinct entities, right? It's really space time. When you're dealing with relativity, you you are no longer measuring one without the other. They're in, inexplicably yeah. intertwined in your measurement. And we, and we don't see that so much on Earth, but if you were near a black hole or even near the sun, you would have to start taking that into consideration with both time and space measurements. We touched very slightly on that with Peter's bit about the uncertainties that are brought in by relativity. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, relativity normally doesn't intrude on our lives because it just doesn't affect systems. It's like um, the Flat Earth Society saying the Earth is flat because we have no evidence to contrary to that. And then you can start to devise some quite complicated experiments, maybe, that then show that the Earth is actually cylindrical. Um, but from every sort of normal operating point of view, the Earth is flat and it's fine and it's a good working principle for maps <laughs> um, until you start to m try to map the globe and then you end in 
big problems because as as you get further north or south, things appear on maps larger than they ought to. So it's the same sort of thing. Yeah, I get I get that. Yeah. Um, and what about the fact that time as experienced is different? I suppose MPL is not involved in that at all, are we? Because that's kind of a more psychological thing. Yeah, Maybe how time passes more quickly when you're having new experiences. Or sorry, when, when you're having new experiences, it slows down. Time is measured then, by new experiences, yes. Yeah, and then some and that comes into this theory of if if perception of time is actually is it really about how much happens? Yes. And if nothing happens, how is time propagating differently? Yeah, these are very deep questions. That but ev every day is the same for a cesium atom, isn't it? So you can rely on them. They, they, they always measure time the same way. <laughs> Fascinating. Any more questions, Paris? Uh, nope, I think uh, that's it, actually. Oh, well, I think we've probably come to the end of the time anyway, the allotted time. I, it just remains, I think, for me to say thank you very, very much, Anne. Uh, atomic clock person, um, Peter, who knows everything there is to know about GPS and opinions on much more. Thank you also to our host, Chantal. Thank you so much for hosting us. And thank you for our little technical team behind the scenes. And thank you, viewers slash listeners, for tuning in to this week's episode. So I think that uh, draws it to a conclusion. So thank you very much for tuning in. Do visit MPL web page and look at the sort of stuff that we're doing. Find out about our atomic clocks there. And um, thanks for tuning in. Cheerio.